ya quieren, quieren escuchar la, la charla. Cualquier consulta que tengan sobre cómo poder la, la interpretación, ahí está igual puesto en la pantalla, lo pueden escribir en el chat. Y, eh, Juli del, desde el campus o Melanie les van a, las van a asistir. También las, las instrucciones van a quedar puestas en, en, en el chat, después chicas pongámosla también, así queda fijado ahí para cuando arranquemos. Eh, y también ya estamos compartiendo en vivo en Facebook para todos aquellos que, que no puedan entrar desde Zoom. Perfecto, ahí ya Melanie puso en el, en el chat también, para los que tienen algún problema ya pueden ahí eh, compartirlo, eh, está perfecto. Si querés Melanie ya, ya sacalo de la pantalla porque ya está, ya está en el chat. Eh, bueno, me parece que podemos ir dando, eh, dando inicio a la charla. Eh, quiero agradecerles a todos por, por estar presentes. Eh, la verdad que es una charla muy muy especial que tenemos con eh, Kfir Damari, que es eh, eh, ingeniero, investigador y el cofundador de la startup especial israelí Space IL y obviamente de, de las naves Berejit, de las cuales vamos a estar hablando en el día de hoy. Eh, quiero eh, agradecer principalmente a, a, la, a la Universidad eh, Ben Gurion de Israel, eh, por poder llevar a cabo esta, esta charla, a Alejandro Grimberg, el representante de la universidad en, en América Latina, y a Nava Rusenbadev, presidenta de la Asociación de Amigos de la Universidad aquí en la Argentina. Eh, antes de, de pasar al video presentación de la, de la universidad, quiero también eh, agradecer a muchas distintas instituciones de toda Latinoamérica que, se nos, que nos están acompañando y que compartieron y difundieron la, la charla el día de hoy, a la comunidad Mihai, eh, a FACMA Argentina, también dentro de, de FACMA tenemos a, a COAG, a Unión Sionista Argentina de Rosario, a Círculo, a Maccabi La Plata, 
eh, tenemos al Lace Judío de México y al Centro Israelita Sionista de Costa Rica, que también están con nosotros el día de hoy, así que les agradecemos también a ellos. Eh, y si querés, Melu, para poder ir arrancando, presentamos el, el video de la universidad. Impact, inspiration, passion, excellence, innovation. Impact, because Ben Gurion University of the Negev is so unlike any other educational place of learning. Its impact extends beyond these walls, impacting Israel's Negev region through innovation, technology, and commitment to community. Inspiration, because BGU is cutting edge, unraveling the secrets of life and humanity by conducting groundbreaking research, discovering solutions to the world's biggest challenges. Passion, because science is not just a disciple of reason, it's also one of passion. And it's the passion and commitment to advance science, culture, and society that make BGU's flame of knowledge burn bright. Excellence, because BGU's academic training nurtures the next generation with cross-disciplinary studies based on integration of knowledge from data science to medicine to the humanities. Excellence because in a place where entrepreneurship reigns, terms like accelerator, hub, and hackathon become the norm. Inspiration because when inspired, we look for answers, uncovering different ways of thinking from antiquity to the present day. Inspiration because the spirit is enriched when surrounded by the beauty of art and architecture. Impact, because BGU is the agent of change, with a myriad of people commuting into this vibrant ecosystem to study and work. Impact, because the moving here of thousands of IDF soldiers and officers caused science and engineering programs to boom, and the new North Campus doubles the university size, with its academic and research facilities, Congress Center, and so much more. Passion. Because work doesn't work without play, and campus life demands passion, with a vibrant student body, an amazing sense of community, cultural and social events on campus and off, parties, movie theaters, sports center, pubs, and restaurants. So much energy. Excellence. With three campuses, six faculties, six national institutes, and three affiliated hospitals. 20,000 enrolled students, a third of whom participate in advanced research programs, 6,700 employees, cooperation with universities throughout the world, and hundreds of overseas students from more than 50 countries. Innovation. Because with a high-tech park alongside campus, BGU is at the heart of Beersheba, making it Israel's cyber capital, a Silicon Valley of the Middle East where leading global companies come to leverage the university's expertise. With 2,500 employees, 60% of whom are BGU graduates. Because in this place, world-class research and global enterprise flourish, generating economic growth with more potential profit per dollar than any other investment in Israel today. Because a rising tide lifts all boats. Finally, Inspiration and excellence together make Ben Gurion University of the Negev the fastest growing research university in Israel, fulfilling the vision of Israel's first prime minister who said, The future of Israel will emerge from the Negev. Y aprovecho para darle la, la palabra a Nava Rubén Sadez, presidenta de la Asociación de Amigos de la Universidad de Ben Gurión, para que pueda saludar a todos en este momento. Bien, buen día. Eh, estoy muy feliz que en un momento tan difícil en la Argentina eh, podíamos reunir tanto institución y mostrar que estamos juntos. Este es el más importante. Como dicho, el dicho, Col Israel a Revin Zelazé. Y con toda la situación en Israel la semana pasada, que tuvimos los misiles y nosotros acá estábamos preocupados y no sabemos todavía dónde va a llegar, dónde llegamos a un momento tranquilo en Israel. Con todo esto, ustedes ven que la visión del David Ben Gurion era armar una universidad en el desierto. Ustedes, la gente que llegaron a Israel, conocen el desierto, 
uno nunca no imaginaba que en un desierto así va a haber una universidad. Y de esta universidad van a salir tantos científicos que pueden abarcar en el mundo y en Israel. Así que yo le agradezco a todas las instituciones, a todo, a Mijay, a la sinagoga, a Costa Rica, a todo, que estamos unidos. Esta que necesitamos nosotros en este momento. Ya vieron la película de Ben Gurion, no quiero tomar mucho tiempo, quería que el disertante especial va a hablar, pero quería comentarle algo que, que las eh, autoridades de Israel, el gobierno de Israel, con la municipalidad de Beersheba, la Universidad de Ben Gurion, están tratando que la ciudad de Beersheba, que es una ciudad bíblica, se va a transformar a una ciudad electrónica, tecnológica, todo lo mejor que puede pasar en el negro. Y va a traer mucho trabajo a muchos inmigrantes que a la larga van a llegar a Israel. Así que estoy muy feliz hoy ver a todos, gente jóvenes que interesen en, eh, en el camino a la luna. Gracias, muy amable y todo lo mejor para, para Am Israel. Muchísimas gracias, gracias Nava. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, bueno, y vamos ya de, de lleno en, en la charla. Si querés, Melu, tenemos un video de, de presentación para que puedan eh, eh, conocer un poquito más antes de arrancar con, con Kafir. In the beginning, I was only an idea, a dream, a fantasy. I was born in a bar to three fathers. Soon, I met the rest of my family. I had people who took care of me and helped me grow, and I grew and became stronger. When I met the president of our country, he told me that I carry with me the hopes and dreams of a nation. And he was right. Landing on the moon is not my only mission. I will carry with me a magnometer to study the magnetic fields of the moon. But one of my most important missions is to inspire our kids so they can dream and explore new worlds. And my mission begins today. A couple of weeks ago, I left home and got on a plane to Cape Canaveral. I had hundreds of talented people who worked hard to prepare me for this day. I waited long enough for this moment, and I am ready. Yada, let's get to the moon. Okay, Kafir, well, uh, once again, it's, it's a pleasure to to, to introduce you, we're going to be talking, as everybody knows here, uh, about uh, Bereshit and Space IL, uh, the seventh uh, country in the world that made Israel uh, to get to the moon. So, Kafir, it's really a, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm really sorry about my pronunciation, but <laughs> of, the, of the name. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor for us. Thank you. I would say it, uh, it's my honor. Uh, to be here uh, with you and, and tell you uh, our story. I'm happy that you said that people already know about it, uh, but I would love to, to tell you know, what happened, how it, it was created, and, uh, and where we are today. Let's, let's start at the beginning. What, uh, what is Space IL and how, how did it uh, uh, began and how, when did the idea first became uh, a possibility to you? So just like the video uh, said, you know, it started uh, with three fathers that had the opportunity to be one of the, the three founders of, uh, of Space AL. Uh, again, in my background, I'm a communication system engineer. I did my bachelor and master degree in uh, Ben Gurion University. And when I wanted to open uh, my own startup, uh, a friend uh, on Facebook, I had all kinds of ideas, but a friend of Facebook wrote that he want to open uh, the Israeli team competing in an in international competition called the Google Lunar X Prize competition. Uh, and the competition was uh, a competition when you had to build a robotic unmanned spacecraft to land it on the moon, move 500 meters and transmit images and videos back to Earth. Uh, and he wanted to open the, the Israeli team. I told him, if you're serious, I'm in. And this is basically how we started. 
with a concept of building um, um, a satellite, uh, basically satellite design, uh, it's called CubeSat. It's 10 on 10 on 30 centimeters, really, really small, the size of a bottle. That was the initial design of the spacecraft. We wanted to add the uh, landing capabilities. And, and this is how it started, but that was in 2010. A lot of things happened since then. The spacecraft became much bigger. And the timeline took much longer than expected. And the budget became much bigger. Uh, but it all started from someone, friend on Facebook that wrote that he want to open this uh, Israeli team. And, and Kafir, you, you said that, that you, your background is not about the space technology. Where, where do you, uh, what's your specialty? And, and did you ever think about being involved in something like this? So I never imagined that I will be involved in, uh, you know, a project with, that uh, will try to land, uh, you know, spacecrafts on the moon. I will say that my background comes actually from uh, computer science. I started programming when I was really young, at the age of six. Um, and uh, this is what I, I, I've done most of my, uh, in, uh, in my army duty, I went to a, um, um, the intelligent forces to the A200 unit when I worked in uh, cyber security. Uh, and then later on, I continued with this field of cyber security. I also founded a few companies in this field, uh, but to the whole concept, to the whole uh, field of space, I got only through the story of space. Yeah. And, and Kafir, we are talking about uh, landing in, in first reaching and then landing in the moon, uh, only six countries before Israel and only three countries landed in the moon. Is that right? Uh, yeah. you're, you were immersing yourself in an experience that, that almost no one in the world uh, was able to, to accomplish uh, uh, from the beginning. Uh, do you, did you think that it was a, a reality or, or it was something that along the years it became, it became more real? So it's a complex answer, but I will say that although I didn't, I didn't come from a, a, uh, an expertise in, in space engineering, I would say that th the fact that you know, we took upon ourselves um, a mission that looks impossible, this is something that I can relate and relate you know, through my life, uh, wanting to take uh, big challenges and wanting to do something uh, you know, important for the state of Israel. So I think this is something I always hoped that you know, I, I will continue on doing. Um, but the fact that it's, uh, it's landing on the moon, I would say that it sounds impossible, but when you break it down a little, and you know, we met the three of us in a bar in the city of Hulon, and started thinking about how we're going to do that. And we used you know, the, 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 the physics that we learned in the new university. And one of our friends, it was uh, me together with Yariv Bash. He's an electronic en engineer and Jonathan Weintraub, he was our space engineer. He was working in the Israeli aerospace industry at that time. And, and we took all of our knowledge and tried to break it down. And we saw that it's, it's doable, it's possible. And uh, so we believe that we are trying to do something that was never done before, but we truly believe that in Israel, we all the capabilities in Israel, uh, we, have, we have the possibility of doing it. I would say that Bereshit is the first Israeli mission in deep space. But even before that, Israel had amazing capabilities around Earth. Uh, if we're talking about uh, image satellite or spy satellite or even communication satellites, uh, Israel uh, had a lot of expertise in 2010 when we started, and we just wanted to take it to the next level instead of doing something around Earth to take it farther away to get to the moon and add landing, landing capabilities. And I will say that what we thought in 2010 wasn't exactly correct. As I said, the spacecraft became much, much, much bigger when we tried to, uh, when we started with the engineering process and we realized that although the spacecraft was supposed to weigh five kilos, uh, the whole spacecraft, the smallest fuel tank we were able to find was seven kilos, which was <laughs> heavier than the whole design. And the spacecraft uh, began, it became bigger and it didn't happen one time, it happened four times. 
And instead of uh, a small battle, we actually got a big family table that weighed eventually 585 kilos. So around a hundred times more than the initial design. And so we did believe it's doable, but we didn't know how complex it is. And maybe it's good that we didn't know that back then. Let me, let me tell the audience that any questions you may have, you can write them in the, in the chat. We are going to be asking Kafir at the, at the end. Uh, and how was the process? Uh, because from that uh, bar talk to the reality, how many years, how many people, uh, what was the budget and, and what was the, the relationship with the, with the government, with Israel to make this possible? So it's a really good question. I would say that uh, there were a few phases. When we started, we started uh, the three of us and we started to collect volunteers. And it started with a team that everyone were volunteers. Everyone wanted to do that in order to do something special for the state of Israel. I would say maybe that it wasn't just, you know, one goal, one, you know, it started from the competition, but really quickly we realized that um, the $20 million prize from the competition, we want to invest them in promoting science and scientific education. And we realized that we don't want to wait to that moment. We want to make sure that we'll get kids inspired. And uh, we've done a lot of educational work that I can also elaborate. Uh, but I would say that some people did that because it was the smallest spacecraft ever. And really with the smallest budget. And I will talk about the budget in a second. Uh, some people did that because of the educational impact. And I will say even now that we've met more than 2 million kids during our uh, work uh, during the years uh, and got them inspired to study science and technology, technology, engineering and math. And some people did that for Israel, to take Israel to places we've never uh, been before. But through the process, now you can understand one, why people wanted to volunteer in the project. So we started with volunteers, but as the project became bigger, as the spacecraft became bigger, we realized it's not good enough. And we have to have a core team of full-time employees in the beginning, it was a small team. And then uh, around four, uh, somewhere between four to five years into the project, we also hired a professional uh, CEO. In the beginning, it was uh, Dr. Ran Privman, later on, Dr. Ido Antebi. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first thing that uh, the new CEO did uh, was to make the whole team full time employees. And uh, so if we started from everyone were volunteers, eventually we got to the point that we have 40 full-time employees working the project. And it was with a, a close collaboration with the Israeli Aerospace Industries that also had around them the, the same amount of people and a few more people in the Weizmann Institute uh, that uh, uh, were also part of uh, the lending site and, and some other aspects. And together it was around a team of 100 people working on the project, uh, and uh, that, was, that was the team. We had a really good relationship with the government, uh, the Israeli Space Agency tried to help as much as possible. Uh, but I will say that most of, the, uh, most of the funding, which started from $8 million, but eventually got to $100 million, the, the final cost of the spacecraft, yes, uh, most of the funding came from private individual, uh, we are again a nonprofit, and uh, we we promote science and scientific education. So people donated. Uh, basically, ninety-seven percent of the money came from private donors, uh, and they were led by Maurice Kahn, who donated more than forty-seven million, and, and the Edison family more than twenty-three millions, and other donors that you know donated millions uh, to make this idea into a reality and to make it happen. And. Um, but before you ask me another question, I want to mention also that it wasn't just big donors. And, you know, we're always mentioning them and it's, uh, the, the, without them, it wasn't doable. But I also want to, uh, to tell you the story of uh, a young 13-year-old uh, 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 boy from the United States that uh, donated the $18 he got uh, for Hanukkah. So that, and I'm quoting him now, so that Israel can reach the moon. And so we really have to say a lot of thank you both to the big donors and the small donors and everyone that made this happen, the employees, the volunteers, the partners, and there were so many of those during the years. 
and and before we we get to the the landing and and, and the development of the of the of Bereshit, uh, I want to talk about the environment that made this possible. Because do you think that what what does Israel as a country and as a technological hub uh, does to help the entrepreneurs, to help the startups, and to help all these projects uh, to be be able to to exist? Uh, would I don't I don't think maybe this would have been possible without the uh, this environment and this uh, Israeli support. So so I, I totally agree, and I will say that there are a few parts to this answer. One part is uh, you know in general in Israel for startups there is a huge uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, there's a uh, huge uh, you know support, and uh, you know this is something that a lot of people are working on their own startup, their own idea, and it's something really, really open. You know, on a cultural level, people are really open for crazy ideas. So although it's a crazy idea, people didn't throw us out of the room and they said, sounds amazing, how can we help? And I think that culture is really important. Uh, I would say that uh, from the space perspective, until 2010, most of the efforts, most of the projects or a military project. We are one of the first civilian project. We are basically the first startup, although we are a nonprofit, so we're not exactly a startup, but we were one of the first to build a big um, civilian space project. Uh, so it was a bit different, but I will say that also in that perspective, the fact that we could, first of all, use all the knowledge, all the know-how, that Israel was able to build in the space uh, uh, um, industry, uh, that was crucial. Uh, and we needed that. We needed the support of the Israeli aerospace industries in order to make that happen. But also something we realized from the early beginning, it's not just the fact that you know, we decided that we want to be a nonprofit because we believe that uh, this spacecraft is the first Israeli spacecraft. So it belongs to everyone who cares about Israel. But I, th I think that also connected to a bigger notion in Israel where um, when we went out and told the story, everyone wanted to help. And you know, if we're looking at all the competitors abroad, it was really hard for them to find partnership, to find, you know, to find the people that can help them. And we, in a one hour drive away, had all the partners we needed and all the knowledge and all their expertise and I think that's also something really unique uh, in Israel when, you know, we have so many great minds uh, sitting together and wanting to help each other. And uh, so I think that was also something crucial. And, and let, let me get to, to maybe the uh, close to the, to the landing part. Uh, you, it's a project that took a lot of years, a lot of budget, a lot of people. Uh, but of course, you know that with all of that, it still can fail because it's almost impossible. <laughs> it's almost an impossible mission to, to, to reach the space. So uh, how ready and how confident were as you as the team when the, when the mission began? And from that uh, talk in the bar a few years before to, to the landing day, uh, did, you, did you believe at that time that, that uh, did you say like, whoa, I can't believe that this is really happening? So I think I, I didn't say, wow, I don't believe it's happening, uh, but uh, it was incredible. I will say that, um, you know, it was a long, long process. We, in the beginning with a small spacecraft, we're planning to land the spacecraft by the end of 2012. Eventually we only launched the spacecraft on February, February 2019. Okay, so many years later, uh, but uh, but I think that um, when it happened, you know, we realized that there's a lot of efforts and a lot of work that uh, were invested to make this happen. So we felt comfortable with this, but we did know that things may fail, actually. And I'm, it's not that uh, uh, I had the, the ability to see the future, uh, but uh, uh, 30 minutes before the landing uh, pro uh, started, Someone asked me if something uh, can fail. And my immediate answer was, yes, many things can fail. Okay, and, and it's recorded on video. 
Uh, so you can see that I'm not just making it up uh, now. Um, and the reason is that, yes, this is something that was considered impossible. Uh, it's the first Israeli mission. It's, you know, it made Israel the seventh country in the world to capture the moon, the fourth to try to land on the moon. We were the first private, first private organization in all the world that tried to, to, to land on the moon. Uh, and we did it with $100 million. That maybe sounds a lot of money. For me, it's also a lot of money. But uh, compared to other space missions, it's nothing, really. When we, when we started, uh, the head of NASA came and told us, even if it was 200 million, and even if you only reach the moon, it's amazing, uh, because basically we broke the glass ceiling in, uh, in deep space mission. Uh, we showed that even small organization can do that. And this is something that, again, was considered impossible until that moment. Um, so we realized we're doing something big, and I, I like to say in general, when I'm doing lecture also to kids, that science is hard and a lot of things will not work. And uh, you need to continue on uh, until eventually uh, you'll succeed. Uh, so we, we knew there is a possibility that things will fail. Um, and we were hoping that uh, we'll succeed as much as possible. And uh, before the landing, I want to talk about the, this that you said, the, the kids uh, reaching the moon. It's, 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 of course, the primary objective, but uh, being able, you, you said a, a, a phrase that, that it, I felt it was, was great. Uh, we, you, you changed the Apollo uh, uh, imaginary in everywhere in, in Israel to the Bereshit. I mean, that, that is something that, that for the kids in Israel, it, it, it's, it's something really big and an inspiration that, that I think uh, they, they, they really need in order to achieve something as as impossible and as crazy uh, to of, of uh, like this, uh, just to even try something like this, I think that that uh, that per se is like uh, maybe even more important than reaching the moon. I, I totally agree. I'd like to I like to say that the mission was to get to the moon, uh, but the vision was to inspire the next generation. And basically, when we started, the reason. We decided to be a nonprofit. And again, I think we were the only nonprofit from all the teams in the competition. And the reason for that is we realized that we want to build the first Israeli spacecraft, but make sure it won't be the last. And we didn't plan to build the next one, although eventually we'll get to that. It's happening. Uh, but we realized that in order that uh, for Israel to have future spacecraft, we need the scientists and we need the engineers. And this is why we invested a lot of efforts. This is why we had an educational department. This is why we had hundreds of volunteers that went into classrooms and met the kids and told them our story and told them, that, you know, we came from all different places around Israel with different expertise. And we had uh, women and we had men and we had young and we had old to show them that it's possible to show them that, you know, we're building this spacecraft, but they will be the one that will build the next spacecraft. And I think that the biggest impact for Bereshit wasn't the impact that we've, we've made on the moon, but actually the impact we've made on, uh, on Earth. Um, yeah. That, that, yeah, that's, that, that phrase is amazing. Uh, let's go to, the, to that day. Uh, how was it? Uh, how, was, how, how was you personally? <laughs> I, I imagine uh, really, really nervous and, and excited. Uh, but how did everything go? Did it go as, as planned? So, so maybe if, if I, I'll take us one step back because you need to realize we started in 2010 and for many years we worked and we always thought it's around two years from now, three years from now, it took us a long, long time. And eventually in the beginning of 2019, we were able to finish, to uh, take the spacecraft and, and to send it to Cape Canaveral, Florida. And I think that the launch moment was really exciting because this is how we started our journey. Before we'll get to the moon, I will tell you that even during that journey, you ask me if things may fail, many things didn't work as expected. The team had to work day and night to find ways to make it happen with all the problems. We had problems, uh, some dust during the launch connected to one of our uh, uh, cameras that use, is used for navigation. It's called the Star Trekker. Um, and um, 
It didn't work as expected. We couldn't use it to navigate the, spec the, the spacecraft as needed. Uh, we needed uh, to use other mechanism. We needed to change the whole route. The computer did some problems. We had a lot of issues. And really, the team had to work really, really, really hard to be able to get to the moon through all those challenges. On April 4th, that was the moment that we've made history. That was the moment that we've uh, uh, reached the moon and captured it. Um, and a week later, we tried to land. And uh, I will tell you that we were all excited. You know, we, we got to a place, you know, no one has got before. We were really, really, really excited. We knew that things might fail, uh, but we were hoping that uh, things will go as expected. And they did go as expected for most of the way. You need to realize that the distance from Earth to the moon is uh, 380 a thousand kilometers, okay? Because we orbited Earth for many times, we actually did 6.5 million kilometers. The problem started 13 kilometers before the end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that, that means that anything, any, any, any small thing can, can fail at any time in, in a difficult mission uh, as this. Totally. And uh, actually it wasn't just one failure. It was three failures that happened uh, just one after the other. It started with a hardware malfunction with one of our uh, IMU. And IMU uh, is, uh, um, is part, again, uh, of the system that allow us to know how the spacecraft is moving. Basically, it's the same thing we have in the phone that knows how the phone is moving. So we can play all kinds of games. We had the same type of sensor on the spacecraft and we use that in order to understand how the spacecraft is moving around the, the moon. One of the sensor failed and uh, the spacecraft automatically moved to the backup sensor. A lot of the system, we didn't have a backup uh, uh, system, but here we had, we had another sensor that started working. Um, so the hardware failure, the second problem was the fact that there was a problem in the information flow inside the team. There was one part of the team that knew something that the, the commander of the control room did not know. And what happened is that he took a decision, the best decision he could according to the information he had, but if he had all the information, he would probably take another decision. And that connected to the third issue. And that was an issue, an architecture issue, where if you had to reset one of the sensor, it might have blocked the other sensor, okay? One of the teams saw that in one scenario, when you reset one sensor, it reset the other sensor. And that's exactly what happened in real time. He wanted to help the spacecraft and make sure that the, the sensor that didn't work will start working. But by doing so, he actually blocked the other sensor and the spacecraft saw that all the sensors are not working. So it reset the computer and it reset the engine. And the engine came back, but it was uh, too late. Uh, we've reached the moon, but we've reached in a speed of one kilometer per second, uh, a bit faster than what we expected. Well, technically, uh, technically, we can say that you 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 reached the moon. You had a big a big impact, <laughs> a huge impact on the moon. Um, actually, NASA took picture of the landing site a few days later, and uh, we could see the impact that we've made. So we definitely reached the moon. Uh, and in a way, yeah, it was a sad moment, you know, uh, for many of us, but I think uh, um, we realized really click quickly, and again, you can see it, it's recorded five minutes later, less than five minutes after uh, uh, the landing ended, um, you can see all of us, not just me, talking uh, in, in interviews and, and talking about the fact that, uh, yes, we wanted to land on the moon, uh, but the biggest impact, again, we've made is here on Earth, uh, and we're uh, looking and we're looking forward to see all those young children uh, in Israel and around the world that will be inspired from our mission and will build their own spacecrafts. Uh, so that was really the bigger vision, and I think uh, in that we're we're able to do a really good job. And before going to to the next uh, challenge, that is Bereshit too, you took a. Uh... Uh, with a digital capsule of more than 30 million pages, is that right? To with you in the in the Rashid. why? What did you take, and why was that? So, so yes, uh, we took with us something we call the time capsule. 
It had its special, its special disk that can sustain in a space environment. It had the whole of Wikipedia, for example, in English. Uh, it had uh, uh, symbols of Israel, it had, uh, of course, uh, uh, the anthem, it had uh, the flag, it had uh, the hundred uh, top played songs in history, or in the history of Israel, uh, but it also had um, pictures that we took with kids through the years and made them big digital passenger in the, the Israeli spacecraft and a blessing that they send us and, and picture that uh, they, they've created and, and drawing, sorry, they, they created. And so we had a lot of things uh, on the spacecraft and the manufacturer of that disc calculated. And as far as we know, it survived the crash. So it's up there with all kinds of other surprises for any, anyone who wants to go and, and see. We, we invite you all to go and see what we've left on the moon. I think that's an extra motivation for the kids, knowing that they have their drawings and their pictures up there for someday, maybe they can go and, and reach it. True. Uh, and, and what was the process since that landing or impact in the moon, as, as we can say, to the next part of this challenge that is Bereshit 2? What happened in the middle and, and what was the decision to go ahead with Bereshit 2? Okay. So, so I will say that, you know, uh, again, we didn't plan in the beginning to build another spacecraft, uh, but uh, the fact that we eventually crashed on the moon actually got a lot of people excited about the, the possibility of building another uh, spacecraft. But I would say that it took us a long time to get to this new mission called Bereshi 2. And the reason is that we realized that, you know, in Space AL, when we sat down in 2011 and tried to, to, to understand what are we doing. So uh, there's actually um, uh, a really good uh, uh, TED talk in, in a book uh, by Simon Sink that uh, talks about start with why. So we actually asked ourselves why, why are we doing this? And what we realized is that we want to do the impossible. We want to do the impossible in, in uh, science and engineering. We wanted to do the impossible uh, in education. And we wanted to do the impossible you know, for Israel, uh, for the Israeli story. And when we looked at the new mission of Bereshit 2, we realized it should be something impossible. So just taking another $100 million and doing the same mission wasn't good enough for us. Although we crossed on the moon, we, but we did show that in $100 million, you can reach the moon. So we wanted to do something unique, uh, something exciting. Uh, and I would love uh, to tell you about the Rashid too, but maybe before that, I think we have a short uh, video that we can show. Yes, of course. Let's pass uh, Melu, if you have over there, the, the video of the Rashid too before the, the presentation. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so, so we had a lot of ideas. We looked about the possibility to go to Mars and many other things, but uh, eventually uh, we got, we decided that we're going to, uh, uh, to go back to the moon. 
And I will say that through this process, you know, we also got a lot of support from Len Blavatnik and the Simon family. And this allowed us to hire the new CEO, Shimon Sarid, uh, who, ha who has been many years in the, um, the uh, Israeli Air Force and later on in, in Elbit. Uh, he's a bit older than me, I would say, uh, but with a lot of expertise. And he actually came with the idea that instead of just going with one spacecraft, we can go with three spacecraft connected. Actually, I have it here, you can see. So we're going to go, <laughs> that's the model. Uh, that's the model of Bereshit 2. Just to make sure we also have the model for Bereshit 1. So we took the uh, same design. <laughs> we took the same de design of Bereshit uh, 1, uh, but instead of landing it, we took, off, we took out the landing legs and uh, we decided this is going to fly all the way to the moon and then it's going to disconnect and open the legs. And basically we're going to have um, two different landers that are going to land on two different locations on the moon. We are going to have after that, so we're going to have two landing events and there probably will be a uh, two weeks uh, between uh, one between the, the other. Um, so that's one thing. So we're going to have two landings in one mission that is going to cost the same amount of money, around $100 million. Instead of one landing, we're going to do two landings, something that was never done before. Uh, but what really excites me is the fact that after the landing, the orbiter will keep orbiting the moon. And it will keep orbiting the moon uh, for many years, for around somewhere between two to five years. And uh, during those years, we're planning that um, we'll have uh, students, uh, university students and high school students from all around the world that will be able to connect to spacecraft, get information from the spacecraft and, uh, and participate in the scientific mission. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Ben Gurion University as, as a partner in, uh, in that uh, mission and help us uh, find the right uh, scientific uh, payloads that we want to take uh, with us. Uh, and we're working now on creating the international partnership uh, with other space agencies and uh, ministries of education uh, to actually be able to connect kids around the world to the Israeli mission and allow them to do their first space, their first steps in space engineering. And and Kfir, you you had for Bereshit one, uh, the budget was of course much bigger than than you expected, but uh, relatively small compared to to different projects and and ideas like this. Only one hundred million. Uh, in this particular case in Bereshit two, uh, what is the the idea, the process, and 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 what's the difference in in the in reaching to that goal, you, you of course said that you had international help right now. Uh, so how, how do you achieve that? And, and of course, I, I think it, it must be easier for you and, and for all the team to, to get this help and this funding uh, after Bereshit 1. I think it's, it's, it's a different uh, idea because you already showed that, that it is possible. So, so totally, first of all, we come with a lot of expertise, both from all the things we learned in Bereshit 1, but also from the fact that Shimon came with many years of expertise into the project. And this is why today, uh, and, you know, different from what we had in 2010, uh, we are much more certain in the, in the design and the process. I would say that in Bereshit 1, it took us many years to find a design that can actually reach the moon, uh, but now we already had that design and used that as the baseline to build the more complex system with the two different uh, uh, lenders. Uh, regarding uh, you know, the, the support, uh, so we are working now on creating those international partnerships uh, and, uh, you know, and, and all the, the partners and, and the donors for, for the next mission. Uh, the Israeli Space uh, Agency already promised uh, $6 million dollars. And we've already raised uh, around uh, um, three and a half uh, for us, uh, but uh, we need most of the money basically in, in uh, 2023 and 24. Uh, so uh, we're working now hard to finalize all the all the agreement that are uh, in line. And before we, we start to, to, to finish, uh, if there are 
if there are any more questions, you can leave them in the in the chat. Uh, one of those is about the future. Uh, the advancements in technology, I think it's uh, amazing year to year. It, it's, it's, you never can expect, I think, 20 or 30 years before what in what moment we are right now. I think uh, if you said in, in the 1990 in Israel, we're going to go to the moon, I think you, you will maybe go in, into a, a psychiatric world. <laughs> uh, but right now, uh, it's something that, that it's, it's possible. You, you showed that it can be done. Uh, what do you think that different projects can be can be made in here to the next 10, 20 or 30 years? I mean, uh, what, what are the next steps and possibilities? So there's the story of Israel. And for Israel, as I said, we have amazing capabilities in the military aspects of space. I think that what SpaceL showed is that we have a really huge potential in leading the civilian space, just like we do in other fields, for example, cybersecurity. Uh, we can do the same thing in, uh, in, in uh, space. Um, but I think in general in the world, if you'll see, uh, if you look at the trends that are happening now with this concept of new space, of building smaller and lighter and much cost-effective uh, uh, system, um, you will see that we were the first to reach the moon, the first private organization to reach the moon. But in the next uh, few years, you will see many other private organizations that are going to do that. There is a, a big a renaissance of, of uh, countries and, and, and private entities that are uh, doing uh, moon missions. Uh, humanity in general, I think, is going to Mars. Uh, so you will see a lot of interesting thing in the space uh, arena in uh, in the the next uh, decade. And and in in your personal and particular experience, uh, we are talking about a, a project that that began in in 2010 2012. The the idea and you're you're thinking about uh, Bereshit two maybe ending in in more than uh, five years from now. So it, it's like. Uh, more than 15, 20 years of your, of your life. What was this experience like and, and this process uh, to you personally and to maybe, of course, all the team? So first of all, we are hoping to, to get the spacecraft to the moon around 2024 and have another two or uh, between two to five years around the moon. Uh, and I would say that on a personal level, it was an amazing journey. You know, when we started in 2010, uh, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. Uh, I would, and we were planning to land the spacecraft in two years. I never imagined that I will get to the to the launch uh, in, with a five-year-old kid in a two-year-old girl. Uh, so it was an, an amazing experience, also for 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 me, for for the whole family. Uh, I think it was uh, an amazing uh, journey, and a lot of things we didn't imagine uh, happened uh, after uh, getting to the moon. Uh, we also got one of the highest honors in Israel to light uh, the torch in Israel Independence Day, which is something that, you know, I didn't imagine that I will do that. Here. And of course, not in a, in a young age. Uh, so really, it was a great honor uh, and a great journey. Uh, and we're continuing on. You know, it, it didn't stop. We're working hard and now on another mission and working hard, not just on, again, the engineering, a lot of the effort that we have today are to find all the right ways to have inner, even deeper connection to the, the next generation, to allow them not just to believe that they can do it in the future, but even now when they're in high school, to let them already start their first steps in space engineering, in, 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 you know, sp in, in scientific exploration of space, and, and let them actually be part in, in the next mission. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's exciting. I'm really grateful for having the opportunity to do a lot of things that are uh, also, let's say, good to the heart when you're doing that and, and, and make you happy in the end of the day. And before you finish, I wanted to leave a, a message for everyone here involved, but, but let me uh, uh, change one second into Spanish to tell something about the, everybody that participated and the, and the university. Bueno, eh, gracias realmente a todos por, por, por estar el día de hoy. Ahí en el, en el chat acabo de dejar el mail de, de Alejandro, de, de la Universidad de Ben Gurión. Todos aquellos que quieran conocer más sobre los proyectos de, de la universidad, 
eh, participar o colaborar. Eh, eh, ahí están preguntando cómo se pueden colaborar como voluntarios de Argentina, cómo podemos ser parte. Eh, directamente ahí le escriben a Alejandro, igualmente a todos los que participaron, van a, vamos a estar enviándoles un mail con toda la, la información. Eh, y ahí van a poder colaborar eh, con la universidad específicamente. Y ahora le voy a preguntar a, a, a Kafir eh, preguntas, últimas preguntas específicas sobre, eh, sobre la, eh, la forma de colaborar principalmente con, con Space IL. Eh, And, and Kafir, before we, we end, I have a, a, a little bit uh, more, a few questions. Uh, if we already told about how everybody can, can contribute and participate with the university, but we have a lot of people asking how can they contribute from here to be part of this project and, and to contribute to Space IL also. So, so of course, uh, first of all, uh, you're welcome to go to our uh, website, uh, which is uh, spaceil.com. Uh, and you can also uh, donate and you can also ask to be a volunteer. We're actually building now a team of uh, uh, volunteers abroad that can take our messages and take the story of Space Ale into classrooms uh, around the world. Uh, so you're welcome to do that. And of course, to follow up in, uh, uh, on Facebook and Instagram and uh, join our newsletter. Uh, letter. And you know, we would love to have everyone uh, participate and, and take part in, uh, in the next journey. And through the mission, I believe that there will be other uh, new exciting opportunities. So if you'll follow us, you'll be able to hear everything. And we have also another question. How many people work right now at Space IL? You said that you had like 100 for the first very sheet. And right now, what's, uh, what's the number? So it, it, it was 100 together with the Israeli Aerospace Industries and, and others. In Space IL, we had around uh, 40. And after the mission, we, uh, as planned, uh, cut down the number of people because you don't need the whole team through the whole mission. And now I think we are around uh, 19 people. Uh, and will grow as the spacecraft and, the, and design uh, will become uh, uh, more and more detailed. Okay, Kafir, uh, personally and from in name of uh, Ebraik, it was really a pleasure and an honor to have this talk. I want to thank, of course, the, the university, Nava, Alejandro, for making this possible. And before we, we finish, I, I would like for you to give a, a message for all the, uh, not only the kids that, that you inspire, but for everyone, that are really far, maybe from Israel, but at the same time, we feel very close. Uh, so uh, I think that, that you, you showed that the impossible is possible. So I want to, to maybe to end with something like that. So, so I really like that uh, sentence. I don't know if you realize, but if you take the word impossible in English and take out the, few, the first few, uh, uh, um, the first two uh, letters, uh, the I am, uh, you actually get possible. And I like to say that sometimes you need to break it down a little, somewhere between the, the M and the P uh, in the word impossible, uh, to realize it's possible. But the most important thing, and I think that's my message, is that uh, in order to make something impossible possible, you need those two letters, the I'm. I am, and it means that you, it, we need you. In order to make something impossible possible, you need to do whatever is needed to make that happen. And, and if I can finish with uh, hoping and wishing all of you that you will do whatever is needed to make your dreams come true, uh, but also dream about how to make the world better for the next generation, I think that will be amazing. Kafir, once again, uh, really a pleasure and an honor for us in here in Hebraica to, to be here. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to, to uh, pass in Spanish one second to, to thank everybody for, for being here, but I want to, uh, once again, it, it was uh, uh, an amazing experience for everybody here in Argentina and, and Latin America be able to, to hear you. Thank you. Bueno, eh, gracias, gracias a todos por, por haber participado. Quiero agradecer una vez más a Nava, a Alejandro, a todas las, las instituciones de, de acá de la Argentina y de toda Latinoamérica que participaron. Recordamos que la charla va a estar en Facebook eh, en vivo. Vamos a estar también compartiéndola en YouTube, en el campus virtual. Eh, y ahí recuerdo una vez más que en el, en el, en el chat ahí está el, el mail de Alejandro. Si quieren participar o a, colaborar de cualquier manera que sea disponible con la, con la Universidad Ben Gurión, lo pueden hacer ahí. Eh, 
Así que bueno, gracias a todos por, por haber participado eh, y nos vemos en la, en la semana, va a haber muchas más novedades con muchísimas más charlas sobre, eh, sobre Israel y sobre muchísimos más temas tecnológicos que estamos preparando. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Thank you very much.